Hi, I'm Addie Olvera with Ballots for Bernie, also a new member of Voting Rights Task Force. And we are here live streaming um, to talk about our experiences as poll workers. I am with um, Kathy Green, who is a poll worker in Contra Costa County, Mario Moracaya, who is also a poll worker in Contra Costa County, and I'm here with also with Jim Soper, who is our expert from uh, Voter Rights Task Force and also ContestCast.org. Um, let's see, we are gonna, we are so excited to be here. This is a post-election discussion about our experiences as poll workers, and we would love it if you chimed in about what your experiences are. If you're watching this video after it's gone live, we will be watching the feed of the comments and we will try to have a discussion with you about, you know, what was it like for you as a poll worker or a voter walking into the polls? Um, did you have to vote provisionally? Um, and if so, why did they tell you you had to do that? Um, and just, you know, give us um, some um, feedback about what your experience was so we know how to share your voice about um, voter experience and we're advocating for you. I also want to give props to Karina Acre Paez, who's our live stream video uh, director today. And um, uh, everyone here is a volunteer, and none of us uh, get paid to do this work, although we would love to raise some money to have a stipend volunteer to help organize us a little bit more. Um, we have poll workers, there's poll workers throughout the state and poll workers throughout the nation and we'd love to be able to be a more coordinated effort and we want your help. So if you're interested in supporting our work um, as uh, ballot observers, poll workers, uh, poll watchers, please go to gofundme.com forward slash take back the vote. Anything, one dollar, five dollars, everything helps. So please contribute. So I'm going to pass the mic on to Jim Soper, and he's going to ask us a series of questions so we can share our experiences with you. Thanks for watching. Hi. Um, thank you all for being here. Let's start off by having each of you tell us a little bit about where you worked and what you, some of the things that you saw on, on election night. And, what your day was like for starters also, because uh, it's a long day and I think people need to be aware of that. And I will add again, we will welcome comments from, from the audience to, about maybe experiences they had on election day and what happened in the polling place. But Mario, let's start with you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so I work uh, in Richmond, California. Uh, I was at, we were supposed to originally be at the Triangle Court um, uh, complex, which is in the Iron Triangle neighborhood of Richmond. Uh, but apparently, they uh, had construction going on that day at that location. And so about a week or so in advance, they told us that they were moving the polling site to an elementary school nearby. That was uh, Peary's Elementary School. Uh, so they had us set up in a kind of a room near the entrance. It was a pretty small room, uh, but I would imagine given the short notice that they had no choice but to find whatever was available and use that. Uh, so that was one issue that I had. Um, overall, uh, my own experience, uh, I know it's kind of a taxing day because they have you working since about 6 in the morning, and I was there before that. Um, until about nine or so at night. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to do was make sure that everything flowed smoothly and, and nothing happened, nothing you know crazy happened, no shenanigans. And so for me, it was, uh, I, was I didn't feel tired because I, I knew that I came in there and I had a job to do and that's what I did. Um, so uh, yeah, overall a positive experience for me. Um, Although I do hear that some people had problems. Kathy? Hi. Um, I worked at a polling place in a church, and it was a great big room. So the people that, the inspector and, um, had done this many times before, so they were really efficient. We had about five or six high school um, 
people come to help. And um, so that helped with getting the tables arranged and set up. And uh, then I went, that went pretty smoothly. Then we got a big rush right away. And I this was my first time doing this. So I had no idea what, but pretty quickly it became clear, you know, just to take the roster and, and check the check it, the people and get them. We had three different precincts in that polling place, so we had to give them a ballot chip for the the right precinct. And um, so yeah. Did so you, yeah. I've heard of that where, where they have multiple precincts in the same polling place. Are, are people right. being given the wrong ballot? Did that happen? I, I would I didn't hear about it. It's not very hard. I mean it's right by their name, the number of the ballot they yeah. should have. No one looked at it and came back and said this doesn't look right. I didn't see I don't know what would what the real differences would be, except yeah, the town name. So my um I'll I'm gonna add to that. So my experience was um that it was Pretty efficient as well. We had an inspector that had been doing it for a while, and prior to him being an inspector, he was a rover. Um, and so he um, he'd been doing this since he was in high school, I believe. And he was, you know, been doing it maybe 10, 15 years. Um, so I really enjoyed working with him. There was, you know, I, I'm thinking if the improvements that need to happen probably are more on the ROV end than it was at least for our pool site. Um, uh, improvements on a poll worker. So, but I'm going to add about the question of, that you just asked Jim about the uh, precincts. Um, there was two precincts at our school site, and the only difference there might have been like uh, if they were voting on a school board member, and so if the voter didn't know that there was a school for a board trustee or whatever to vote on. They wouldn't know that they were voting on the wrong, unless they were really excited about coming to vote for that board trustee member, which could happen. They would have noticed it's not on their ballot. Would have asked. So, because of the precincts that were on the poll site are so close together, um, their neighboring, uh, their neighboring uh, precincts, then they might not be much of a difference besides maybe um, a school board school board member or, uh, you know, board trustee or, or maybe a parks, someone like from a park district um, uh, who's being elected. Um, another slight difference could be um, a city council member that might just be slight border, borderline. Um, in Concord, where I live, all the city council are not by district, so you wouldn't notice. It's just vote for two, so you wouldn't notice if a city council member was you know, was missing. Everybody would have the same city council members on their in their city. Uh, wouldn't be different. So, um, unless someone is really paying attention to who's on the ballot, they would notice that the precinct about they would give in the wrong ballot. Um, but if there was an error made, it would probably be on the ROV side that they didn't list it correctly on the roster, um, and then we would have issued it incorrectly. But it was pretty easy process in terms of writing down exactly what we see on the roster, give them what the ballot's supposed to give, and then the poll, uh, the ballot table, the ballot issuing table reads this number, gives them the right ballot. So the, the, that, the actual ballot table, um, poll workers don't really know what your name is or, or anything because they're just giving you the number that they, of the ballot that, they, that you just gave them on a piece of paper. So that's my experience for for the start of the morning. Okay, uh, thank you for, for that answer. Let's also start a little back up here and let any of you describe what makes up a polling site team? Who's there? What, who's in charge of what? And what kind of equipment do you have to to watch over and, and, and monitor? Uh, so for me, this was the second time that I worked as a poll worker um, uh, at the same location, well, not the same location, but it was supposed to be the same location. Uh, I worked with the same people that I did uh, for the primary elections. Um, so from what I understand that we had to, we were supposed to have more people this time around than we did in the primaries. 
it wasn't the case for us. Um, we had the same amount of people. Uh, for me, my job was basically to uh, take the ballots, detach them, and hand them over to uh, the people inside of a uh, privacy envelope. Uh, so we had one person doing that, that was me. We had three people working the, uh, the registry role, so we were the list of all the voters that were assigned to that precinct. Um, and they had divided the roles this time into three different sections. Uh, in the primaries, they only had it in two different sections, so we had two people working there. Everyone had more names uh, per list. Um, so there's people assigned to do that. There uh, was supposed to be somebody assigned to um, what they call an ER station. So I think it's eligibility review, I believe it stands for. Uh, we didn't do that. Um, we didn't have enough people to do that. Uh, and then there's, of course, the inspector who kind of uh, uh, watches over all of us and makes sure that we're doing the right job. Uh, and she herself, actually, who had, she's been doing that for a long time herself, and she helped us out, even though I believe she's not supposed to actually have a job, but she did. Uh, um, yeah, she's not, she doesn't have like an assigned role, but she stepped in and she helped us out. And uh, overall, given the circumstances that we had, I think it flowed pretty smoothly. Um, so that's how we, we all helped to set up, um, uh, in the morning, I, I got there first, uh, and I met up with the inspector there in the morning, uh, we opened up the, well, we had somebody open up the door, um, and we, we, we set up, us we set up for the most part, and other people started showing up, uh, and then we opened up. for anyone working at a polling precinct. Um, so the difference for us was um, we had our inspector, even though he was supposed to have a role, my understanding, he kind of float around. He insisted to be at the, um, we called the ER station, I can't remember what it was, Eligibility, eligibility yeah. review station, thank you. And it just reminds me of emergency, which kind of feels like it is because all you do is hand out provisionals at this table. And um, so he would not leave the table no matter what, and he kept insisting no voter gets turned away. And so I was kind of excited about that. But, you know, he needed to really troubleshoot any issues and just be willing to move away from that table and go hand more. Uh, it, when I mentioned to him that the um, memory cards were exposed, when I figured out that the, the little uh, placard, metal placard that protects and locks the memory card was open, he all he did was ask me, or the seal's broken. I was like, I don't know. I went over there to check something else and happened to notice the thing was closed and wasn't locking. He gave me the key to go try to lock it myself and I had a hard time liking it, the metal piece was messed up, so all I could think of doing was getting I voted stickers and putting them on the um, on the edges all the way around, so if one of those got broken then I knew someone messed with that um, little slap of metal that protects the memory cards. Um, I, let her, I later mentioned it to a uh, whole... Uh, or ROV employee over the phone that you can call in and she got really stressed about it so she called the inspector right away and made him check and I heard him saying on the phone no the seals are not broken but that's the only way he got up from the table to go check it because when I mentioned that he's like our seals broken I was like here's a key go lock it and I was like it's not locking was he real busy at the table um we were busy yeah, yeah we were but I knew how to work the table I could have done that on myself and he could have um, just handled it, but um, but he was a really good inspector. Other than that, that he was really concerned about the eligibility review station. And he really wanted. It. He was really protective over that space. So, Eddie, when you said this metal piece, uh, something that possibly the evidence of tampering beforehand. Um, absolutely. Um, I worked the primary, and um, when I worked the primary, I 
when I worked the primaries, the M100 machines, or I don't know, you might have a picture of it on there, Rob. Uh, yeah, Mario. And um, let's see if we could show them what the M100 machines look like, look like for Contra Costa County, because every county could be using a different kind of scanner. There's these walls on the side with lock that lock up, and that's where the bo the ones you scan your ballot, that's where they fall into, and they're locked. And at the end of the night, we can unlock them and pull the ballots out. Well, when I worked the primaries, the ballot um, walls were smashed in like if someone kicked it. So I was highly concerned about the M100 machines again this year. But when I saw that they looked fine, I didn't think anything. They looked like they were closed. Um, so let's see. I know the there's a. Show the whole box. Yeah, let's do one that shows the whole box. The people want to look it up online, try ES and SM 100. Yeah. Can you see that coming up? Okay. Yeah. So that's what the M100 machine looks like in Contra Costa County. And the size of those walls are what were bent during the primaries. And in the front, of that machine there's a little metal that pulls down if to pull out the, the memory cards at the end of the night and that piece of metal was unlocked and it should have been locked and that's what protects uh, the memory card from being switched so can it or can it take it to tamper with it sure but i didn't notice if it was sealed if i would have looked I just had to take his word for it that when he went to go look, and he said it wasn't broken, then there was no tampering. Could someone have put another memory card in there with a new seal? No, I have no idea because I didn't actually. I don't really know what it looks up up close. I just know that it was a memory card section because I saw a little red um, thing in there, and I was like, "Oh, this is a memory card section, so um, it should be locked." <laughs> Well, this is an issue that we uh, in the case of this machine, sometimes some counties hand out these scanners and voting machines to their polling place employees, poll workers, even the Friday before the election. And they take it home, put it in the trunk of the car, take it home, and it's sitting in a garage overnight or for the whole weekend. And somebody could theoretically then get in and play with a machine. Uh, this is again called the sleepover problem, and we've never really come up with a, a good way to deal with this. And I don't know if you know the history of that device, that scanner, the M100 is a precinct scanner where you put the ballot in to one side and, and it reads, looks at and reads the, the ballot and then puts it into a box. Um, and this is one of the issues that comes up in elections, and if the place that holds the, the ballot, the electronic ballot box, the electronic part is, is normal, then that poses questions. It's not necessarily a problem, but it's, it's a vulnerability, and we need to close up. There's a hundred of them, and we need to close these up, all of them as much as possible. Uh, Okay, let, let, let's go on. Describe a little bit, I'm not totally clear, what happens when somebody comes in to vote? What table do they go at? What happens there? Uh, how do they vote? Then what do they do after? And if somehow, what will take then the exceptional case of the note the, in the poll book, uh, what happens then? Okay. The way we had it set up, the whole cafeteria type table, and we had A through F, G through O, and O through Z, that's the last table. So people, but they weren't very big, so people didn't know, it took them a while to find which table, but it didn't, wasn't a big problem. Then, so they would, that's divided the volume in thirds. We had a really busy period immediately in the morning when people were trying to get their vote done before they went to work. And then at noon we had another surge and then 
after work hours. But there was busy times all through the day too. Um, so what they would come to one of us, I was at the O, G through O, and we had the roster, and um, there was only one copy of the master list. So we were very good on and find, um, or rush away from the table and find the inspector who had the master. Oh, that's just about how it was. So, um, right, so yeah, um, the fellow that sat with me, we took turns reading the roster and the other one making out the little ballot shit to get the right ballot. Um, but I ended up doing most of it because he didn't have his reading glasses with him and he really didn't need them. So <laughs> it's very, very slow. Anyway, um, and our um, inspector, when it wasn't busy and he didn't have anything else to do, he did uh, sit down and help check people into the roster. His wife did that at the, the rest of the time and there was other people that would plug in or, and help her. Um, so it was uh, it, it was fast paced, a, a little hectic at first, but then we got used to it and, and it went fine. Um, then they would take that ballot shit and go to a table where um, three or four sometimes of the high school kids were um, handing out the ballots and then they would just go ballot shit. I go on about what became a problem for, with registering people. Yeah. So many people had so many people had in their ballot in the mail, but they didn't know what it meant. They apparently didn't even look at it, and they often wanted to to bring the ballot mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Other people just didn't understand much about how to vote. And these these aren't children. I'm saying you know mature people look like they would probably know what how to vote. Really, we need to teach people this in school. And I'm really really glad to say that my granddaughter's high school district uh, um, was uh, recruited, and she went and became a poll worker, even though she's not quite old enough to vote yet. What, was there something else I was meant to cover in that bit? What, I'm thinking of, question? when do you get a provision? Oh, when you're not on the voter rolls. Yeah, what happens? Um, then we, if we can't find, we can't find the master list, we would uh, call the inspector and he would talk with them about why, or uh, there was another fellow too that had done this a uh, number of years, so he knew what to ask and find out why they're not on the list. Often people have their vote by mail um, envelope at home and they just thought they'd come in and vote in person. But, um, and, and there, we can explain to them that at least in our county, they, they definitely count provisional ballots, but after the, all the other ballots are counted. So very often people would say, oh no, I'll just go home and get my, the, the envelope. So uh, sometimes, oh, I know what was a problem. A lot of people who weren't on the rolls um, said they had checked the box at the DMV and they thought that registered them to vote. And they weren't. So I'm not sure if, that, if they were either, if that's supposed to, if the DMV is supposed to do something. I hadn't thought about that. Probably, but, yeah. you know. It, apparently the DMV is dropping the ball at some point. We have to check that out. Okay. Do you want to? Um, yeah, question what you said. Um, for us, uh, provisional ballots were very, um, it was a problem. We had over, I think we had actually exactly uh, 100 provisional ballots at our uh, out of how many we had I believe I would like to say about 
250 ballots casted. Um, and I'm, I'm on the tape, it tells you how many people voted for so and so candidate. So I'm not, I don't think they, they would not include provisional ballots, right? So we had 200 or so, 250 or so people voting in with actual ballots that went into the M100. And then we had about 100 or so, actually exactly 100 provisional ballots uh, when I made the count at the end of the day. What about vote by mail? We had 70, mm -hmm. 70, 71. 71 vote by mail uh, envelopes at the end. Uh, so for us, provisional ballots were more so of a problem this time than when I worked the primary elections. Um, and more often than not, it was just people who were uh, at the wrong uh, polling precinct, maybe, or they had their registration uh, switched from another to another party, maybe, um, uh, removed entirely from the rolls for some reason. Um, what else could I think of? Um, uh, or people who were vote by mail that didn't know they were vote by mail. Yeah. They left their their ballots at home. And the complaint that I have with vote by mail would be that it's such a small little box that uh, when you're for, when you're registering the vote uh, at the DMV or wherever, it's such a small little, little box uh, about halfway down with the application that asks you would you like to receive your your ballot by mail. And most people who put that either would either subconsciously put that and not really read what it says or completely forget entirely that they marked that. Um, so I think that's a big issue with people oh, yeah. who, who, who maybe registered a long time ago, they hadn't voted up until this time around, and they totally forgot that they were um, vote by mail. So they either never got their ballot in the mail, or they got it, they lost it, they threw it away accidentally. So any number of things that could have contributed to that. Duana had a comment. Should I read it? Yeah. Um, Dewana Bain is commenting on the live feed that she thinks many people could have confused their um, the sample ballot for a ballot, and people who were voting for mm -hmm. the first time just expected to come in and vote in person. Didn't know about any distinction. Oh. <laughs> review uh, station with the inspector, and so we issued out about 240 uh, provisional, and really high. I felt like it was handing out candy like we did in the primary, so uh, I was really uh, disappointed. I agree with Duena. Thanks for your comment, Duena. That uh, people, we did have a few people that didn't know uh, that their ballot was a real ballot. They thought it was a sample ballot. There was a few amount of people that did get it at home. Luckily, one of us had our envelope from our vote by mail with us, so we would show them, like, did you get this at home? And they'd like, oh, yeah. And But most people, for me, at least, I remember, just I didn't get that, and they'd be really upset. Um, and some people just who did get it would choose not to go home and get it and just vote provisionally. That was okay. We wanted them to vote, so we just um, didn't make them go home to get it. We just let them choose if they wanted to do the provisional or not. Uh, but there was a big amount of folks that were not on the roster, um, and a, a large amount of people who said they did not get their vote by mail, and they we had shown them the envelope and did not remember um, getting the um, envelope. Um, in Contra Costa County, and I'm not sure if the same for Alameda, when you register to vote by mail, you actually have to initial your name. But it's correct. What Ma uh, Mario said is that it's a really small space. You really may not even know what you're initialing, but it looks like it's asking you to initial. You just might put it in and not know what you're really doing. But a way to prove what you actually chose is to go to your local ROV. And Martinez, it's on 555 Escobar for Contra Costa County. Um, and you can ask them to show you a copy, a digital image of your voter registration card. You'll know what you exactly what you provided. You'll know exactly which party you chose. You'll know exactly um, if you initialed that you wanted a vote by mail. And that'd be uh, you know, a great way to 
able to find out if there's some type of election fraud going on. So I want to encourage the viewers who were not on the roster or got a provisional vote to go challenge our league and then come back to Ballot to Bernie and comment uh, on our page uh, on any of the videos. You know, we'll, we always look at the comments and let us know what you found out from your ROV. Um, but, you know, when you, when they process your provisional, there's several stages. So I just want to quickly um, go over that, that there's, in Contra Costa County, they do three levels of verification. They have a lot of workers that um, are checking the first signature. But if this doesn't match, it goes to a supervisor. If that doesn't match, it goes to even a higher, more experienced supervisor. And they're checking your address, your signature, any data you provide. Um, and during the primaries, that provisional acted as a registration card. So if you provided new information that would update your, um, your voter information, would, would dictate what would happen this general election. So uh, that could be a problem if you provide information that is different. Um, come around, it moves things around and might change your precinct location that you used to go into, I'm not sure. The precinct that I went, went to uh, was added, was hosted by a church and during the primaries, and this time it was hosted by uh, the storage room for uh, a grocery store. Um, and But it was the same uh, people. I remember recognizing a lot of the people, but some of the same people that came in and said, I, this is my polling site, um, knew to come to this new spot, but were not on the roll. So that to me was a trigger that they had their new information that they needed to vote at the Harvest House off Monument Boulevard, but they weren't on the rolls. So it's like something is wrong here. Uh, because if they would have gone to the previous location to vote where they're used to, and probably not voted at all if they didn't have the new updated information. But they knew where to come, they just weren't on the rolls. So that to me was suspicious. <laughs> of the polling precinct changed. Uh, and so one of the, the early on problems that we had actually, in, uh, I'm not sure how much communication goes on between departments, but because we had our polling location changed, it didn't occur to anybody to leave a sign at the original polling place telling people where to go to vote now, even though it wasn't that far away. There was nobody there, there were no signs there, so I would imagine a lot of people showed up to vote at that location and the area was probably fenced off or something because they had construction going on there. Uh, so my question is why was there no communication between the people in charge of fence construction and the registrar of voters? Why didn't they communicate with each other to uh, find a more suitable location than, when we were, when, than where we were at and to notify the voters? Now some of the voters that came in told us that they did get something in the mail telling them to go to a new location, in which case that would be fine, but not everybody had that apparently. So some of the voters have no idea. Um, some of the voters that, that I talked to knew some of the other voters that told them that they didn't know that this was a new location. So it's possible that some people who showed up there, they saw that it was closed, they didn't vote, and then they didn't go to the new location and went out, didn't vote at all. Uh, so that's a criticism that I had early on. We had a few people that were upset that they didn't know, they had no uh, way of finding out exactly uh, where the new location was. And I think one of the things that prevented it from being an outright disaster was that it wasn't too far away from where we were supposed to be. And so most people probably stumbled upon it by chance. There were a few people.
shockingly high. We did not have provisionals in 2000 that was brought in after that mess of an election. And, and obviously, it had the evidence that so that people who get their envelopes, people who wrong place or something, that there's some way that you can get their vote in. So it's good that it's there, but it's also saying that we're, we're having too many hiccups in this. Um, far too many hiccups. I also want to note for the audience that all of this is going to change in two to four years. If you go to my website, countedascast.org, C-O-U-N-T-E-D-S-C-A-S-T.org, and look on the left side for a bill called SB 450, which was signed by the governor this year. <laughs> Counties will be able to opt in over the course of the next four years, 14 counties for 2018, the rest of the state in 2020, to opt in to sending out vote by mail ballots to everybody, whether they ask them or not. If they do so, then they opt in to set up voting centers or vote centers for the county where there's a, going to be uh, about one vote center in, for every five precincts or 10 days, up to 10 days ahead of the election. We will have early voting in California. 10 days ahead of the election, about one vote center for every 10 precincts. And then three days the week, starting the weekend before, there will be more. Uh, and that represents a major change in how all of this is going to work. And of course, you know, there are going to be hiccups when this happens. The good news is that if they're opened up 10 days ahead of time, they're going to start to figure out what the hiccups are and be able to, to, to adjust for them, let's put it that way. And, and also, as part of the deal, it's all a package going to opt in for the whole package. It's all the package is vote by mail, vote centers, and as part of the deal, they have to have the voter registration poll books live online. So that when you go in, uh, and well, you're not in our registration poll book, uh, you can register then and there. And or change, we saw a lot of problems when people in one party wanted to vote for something in another party and they weren't allowed to by state law. Uh, and it's really the parties that determine this, but it's backed up by state law so that if you were, uh, you were a member of any party other than Republican, you could not vote in the Republican presidential primary. And a lot of people wanted to vote for Bernie and they couldn't because they were in the wrong party. Um, and so I know a lot of problems there. Uh, what SB 450 is going to do is allow people to re-register on the spot, provided that the registration databases are not hacked, they don't crash, and a whole bunch of other things. And of course, my prediction, I'm a computer person, is we're going to have problems with that, especially early on, is to try to work out the things for this. Uh, but that's going to represent major changes coming down the pipe. Just look for SB 450 and you can find out what's coming. And the decision to opt in is up to your county, the registrar and the board of supervisors. So whether or not they're going to buy into the whole thing or just say keep it as is, as is. And that's up to every county to decide. And it's up really to the citizens of the county to make that decision. So let's go on. One of the things we also saw over last summer were reports of uneven training. What was your training like? And do you think it was good and not so good? Can you comment on that? Um, I'm sure for everyone else as well, uh, the training is simply a one and a half hour class uh, that they teach uh, multiple times. Obviously, they have you sign in so that they know that you took the class. Uh, and in there, they go over the, I think the basics of how how each station at the polling locations work. They give you a manual, which is essentially a book that you take home and you read, and if there's anything you don't understand, there shouldn't be. I, mean, I think it explains it pretty well. Uh, most of the things are common sense. Look up the voter's name, have them sign, send them to the next location. Uh, so overall, I 
course, at least for me, uh, I felt like the the training was pretty adequate. I didn't really have any uh, major questions that prevented me from doing my job. Uh, the inspectors were well trained. Some of them have been doing it for years. Um, yeah. uh, overall, with the training for me, I had no problem with it. I thought it was pretty straightforward. confident when I had the same training you did. It was only 90 minutes and they didn't give us these poll worker manuals. In fact, my daughter brought my granddaughter down to the registrar of voters and asked for one and they were told we don't give them out to first time poll workers, which doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm, um, found a friend who loaned it to me. I wanted to share something that happened to my granddaughter. Um, she uh, was a first time poll worker, of course, only 17. And um, she and her, and her friends from school went and uh, helped. And um, their inspector at, at some point was dealing with a potential voter who was getting very agitated because he wasn't on the voter rolls. So um, she, I guess she had checked on what she could and checked with the uh, central command, command center or whatever, and they didn't have him listed anywhere. So he was getting very agitated, insisting that he wanted to vote. So the inspector said, oh, all right, you can vote, and just handed him a ballot. And my granddaughter's a bit of a stickler for things, and she thought that was all wrong. So she went, um, after the, the next day, she went to the registrar of voters' office and um, reported this incident and didn't use the woman's name, but um, the, uh, the person working for the registrar uh, complimented her and said it was really good that she had reported that because that's absolutely not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to give a personal ballot. And I, there was one fellow at our precinct that was offered a, a provisional ballot and he insisted, I wonder if it's the same guy, he insisted that he wanted to, just wanted to vote and we, we didn't allow him to vote. He had to either take a provisional one or not. Anyway, um, the registrar thanked my granddaughter for turning that person's um, actions in, and um, I'm sure she's going to be a great citizen um, going forward, as will her friend. Um, I think that's, oh, I was going to say, though, we had a whole lot of provisionals also, and we should have um, little public service announcements going over some of these election issues, you know, the simple things. On the TV, it should be um, on all the stations should be required to do this, so people have more um, knowledge about their their government being elected, and they should also take, of course, more responsibility. Um, so the uh, training, I thought there was some major improvements. Um, one, the PowerPoint was much better. I didn't have uh, blaring music, rock music coming out of the background as they did in the primary, so I was able to hear the presenter this time. And the other thing that was an improvement was the introduction to the uh, eligibility review station. During the primaries, um, the ballot table, which I was on issuing ballots, was also trying to resolve provisional issues. So having a separate table so um, for just handling people not on the roster um, who were at the wrong precinct or uh, any other issue could be handled at this particular table. Uh, so that was um, quite nice, an improvement of the ROE in Contra Costa County. Um, let's see, I during the training I had asked a question um, towards the end, you know, I waited till everybody kind of left because I, you know, I, there was just so much limited time. So I said, oh, I'll wait and ask it towards the end. So I asked an RO, the uh, presenter, if the number of signatures on the roster 
equal the same number of voters that the M100 machine tells you. Um, M100 machines are able to tell you every three cards, because in Contra Costa County you have three cards in a ballot. So if every time the three ballots go in, it counts a voter. And everybody has to put in their three cards in, even if there's no votes on it. So my common sense is, well, it, the number of signatures on a roster would mean the same number of voters on a machine. And she said, no, but that's not your area. So, don't, you know, I'm not going to explain that to you. And I said, excuse me? And she said, yes, you know, yeah, I'm not going to answer that question. And I said, well, you know, then I'll just ask. Uh, Scott, which I knew was her, one of her supervisors, and she tried to quickly answer the question. And she said um, briefly, uh, in a much nicer tone, that it was because uh, they uh, created some kind of chaos. Uh, uh, there was some kind of messiness uh, that happened, but it was not a very clear answer to me. I don't even remember because it was not clear at all. Um, but. I, that, you know, once I was working, then I kind of understood the question, my own question. I was able to kind of answer my question. We had um, two incidents where um, when you're giving your ballot, your cards are put in a middle of a folder so that no one can see you, what your answers are. And you could walk all the way to the scanner covering your votes until you slide them in the machine. Well, if we gave you a provisional envelope and the cards in a middle of a folder, you could easily walk to the M100 machine and slide your cards and they'll be counted. And we would not know because you look like a regular voter walking around. And so our inspector decided that if you're voting provisionally, um, that he would tell the person, okay, go get your ballot. And he would tell the ballot table workers, don't give them a manila envelope. Because when they're walking away, then we could see that they're holding a pick pink envelope and we'll know they're provisional they got to come back to us we help them fold it into the envelope correctly seal it and tell them where to go put it in the blue box on it by the exit door so that was um a way for us to know we did have two individuals who um, walked right by us we didn't notice uh, they had manila folders that was covering um their provisional envelope and they split their immediately so what does that mean we can't I mean it was so busy you couldn't run and unlock it and pull it out you know it's already counted in the um, in the uh, receipt it's gonna their votes gonna count the receipt there's nothing you could do you lose the ballot and um, the other thing is how did we notice then that they were provisional voters well we noticed because um, the when we happened to look over just to see how it's going by the scanner, we saw two people with no ballot card and their pink envelope still on their hand. And we're like, <gasps> they ran their ballot through the scanner. And so he actually caught those two. So when you come to the eligibility review station, because you're about to get a provisional, there's something you sign, like a roster. I mean, we don't have your name. Obviously, you're not on the roster, but you sign, you print your name, you sign it. There was 243 signatures, but only 243 envelopes that we counted that night. So that's when we knew we had issued 204. The two that we saw that ran their cards in the machine that explains the, the, you know, but there's one that we couldn't account. We, we didn't have a provisional for them. Um, I remember there being someone who came in, signed, got their envelope, got their card, and then decided that they wanted to go home instead and get their uh, ballot. We never saw them come back. So they did drop off the ballot and the envelope before they left. And so that was just sitting next to us. So that could have been the, the third signature um, that was Does that make sense to you? Okay. So, um, 243 signatures on the roster, but 240 provisional envelopes in our hand. Two that got away and uh, went through <laughs> the scanner, and the one that decided to just leave their provisional and their envelopes behind and go home and get their go by mail envelopes instead. So, maybe they decided to go drop it off in the store.
that. And, and we're seeing with these examples that this gets just really complicated. I liken running a precinct to that, well, running an election in the county to that of a small airline or a large airline. There are, for example, I believe the number is 35,000 commercial airline flights in the United States every day. California alone has 24,000 precincts, close to all of the airlines. And they are trying to run this 24,000 flights uh, with an underpaid staff with all the problems of trying to get the luggage and, and the peanuts and the handle properly. The staff is temporary. And so, and 